Good afternoon, Chairman Parker and members of the Board of Environmental Protection. My name is Nick Bennett. As I said, I reside in Hollowell and I'm the staff scientist for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Um, I've given you some written testimony and also uh, a paper that um, NRCM wrote based on uh, research I did of old documents um, in the DEP files uh, that were produced by um, state government at the time. Uh, Beliden, which is a Swedish mining company, owned the site. And um, so there were some state governments, on, state government documents on which that re report is based and also consultant uh, companies for Beliden uh, produced some reports. And so I may refer a little bit to those uh, comments as well, uh, to those uh, reports as well. I'm not going to read my testimony. Um, I think it, you guys can read it when you get the chance. But I did want to speak first to a, a couple of issues that I sort of hear in your questions and also have heard in, in DEP's presentation. One has to do with being limited by the statute and not being able to do certain things because the 2012 statute doesn't give DEP jurisdiction. So I'll, I'll look at that sort of generally and then also more specifically when it comes to the, the public lands issue. <clears throat> My first point about that is that that bill passed in 2012. In 2014, the legislature rejected um, the, the first go-round of rules. And in 2015, DEP went back with the same set of rules, and the legislature rejected them again. So over the past four years, DEP has had opportunities to seek clarification from the legislature, um, to ask for different sorts of authority, ask for different sorts of language. They have not. Um, so for example, when they say the law requires that we allow mining in floodplains. Well, maybe that's true. But if DEP didn't want that and didn't think that was a good idea, they've had many opportunities to ask to please change that. Um, they haven't. And so we come here, you know, one of my comments is we don't think putting pits or waste rock piles or tailings pond in floodplains is a good idea. We, we're going to say that until someone listens, and in fact, the legislature has listened, and the way they've listened is they've rejected the rules. So if I were DEP faced with what's been happening over at the State House, one of the things I might have done, rather than coming in and saying to you, well, we don't have, we can't, there's so many things we can't do because of this 2012 statute is, well, it's 2016 now, here are the things we're going to ask the legislature for clarification on, or to do things differently. Um, because otherwise, I think there's a good chance that um, the rules are going to get rejected again. Um, these were not small majorities that uh, were in the legislature. In 2014, the roll call vote in the House was 98 to 39. There was no roll call vote in the Senate. Um, in 2015, the House voted 109 to 36 against the rules, and the Senate voted 26 to 8. So these are pretty overwhelming bipartisan votes against the rules. And I think, you know, I, I would agree that part of the problem is the statute um, has forced DEP in certain directions. Well, maybe it's a good idea to ask the legislature to change some of those things. I don't feel that much sympathy with DEP saying there's nothing we can do because the 2012 law says this. If they want to do things differently, they've had the opportunity to ask the legislature, and they still have the opportunity to ask the legislature. And if the administration were to ask for a bill changing some of the things that have been problematic, my guess is the legislature would listen. So that's just an overriding concept, and I'll come back to it um, uh, when I talk a little bit about the, the public lands part. Um, a couple of changes that DEP did make that we were supportive of, they have improved the specifics of the monitoring, background monitoring requirements so that there are more specific contaminants that um, mining companies need to look at. They also have to look at radioactive material. There was no requirement for that in the previous iteration of the rule. That's a good idea. Um, 
It requires three years of baseline um, monitoring as opposed to two. That's a good idea. And the definition, the change in the definition of perpetual treatment such that um, perpetual treatment is defined as a mine that would need post-closure treatment of more than 10 years. That's a good idea. We support all those changes. But there's still a lot of problems where we've um, asked DEP and, and the legislature to make changes before. Um, and those changes have not gotten made and they're back here again. And I'll go through a few of those. Um, one it has to do with the financial assurance. So um, Mr. Crawford said that before they were asking for 50% of financial assurance up front. Now they're asking for 100%. That's fine, except that the financial assurance is not entirely for the right thing. Typically what insurance covers, and I believe the way these rules are written, this is true for these rules as well, is how do you do reclamation at a mine, um, demolish the buildings, reseed areas that need reseeding, maybe cover a pit, uh, cover a waste rock pile, how do you do those things if a mining company goes bankrupt in the middle of the process? And you ask the mining company to put up that money. Maybe that's six or seven million bucks at a, a mine that, a 300 acre mine, something like, or a 500 acre mine, something that likely what we would see in Maine. Not a gigantic mine like the, the Bingham Canyon mine in, in Utah, but a smaller mine. So a good example of that would be the Beale Mountain mine in Montana, which is about a 300 acre site. They had $6 million in bonds for that site. A liner leaked at, on one of their leaching pads, and the damage was enormous. The cyanide leaked out of the leaching pad, contaminated uh, streams, groundwater, and the Clark Forks River for a long way. The uh, company went bankrupt. The cost for remediation is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The Forest Service who issued that permit had $6 million to deal with, with that. So the problem is that the problem with financial assurance with the mining industry is that it has not covered the cost of catastrophes like that kind of massive leak or a tailings dam failure. These rule, we do not believe that main taxpayers should be the guarantor of last resort for a mining catastrophe. It's not acceptable just to put up enough money to do a sort of business as usual cleanup at a mine. You need to have, we believe there should be a third party estimate of what a worst case scenario will cost and the mining company should have to put that money up, up front so the taxpayers don't get stuck with the bill, period. And it should say that simply and clearly. Two, the public lands issue and the issue of removal of ore in, on, and under great ponds and rivers. This is an issue that we have also dealt with with DEP and with these rules before. And we don't think they have changed, that this has changed for the better. First of all, um, in sec uh, th this is dealt with in the siting section, which is 20B, and specifically it's 20B3 and 4. And um, on the one hand, DEP says removal of ore in, on, or under from great ponds, rivers, brooks, and streams, and coastal wetlands is defined in 38 MRC section 480B is prohibited. Okay, that seems straightforward enough. But then they say in section 20B4, these setbacks shall apply unless and until another state or federal agency with management authority determines that mining is allowed in, on, or under the following. And they list a whole bunch of areas, including water bodies. So what they're basically saying there is, we don't know whether we have jurisdiction over these water bodies and areas or not. Because it says they'll apply unless another state or federal agency tells us they don't apply. That's some of the strangest languages in, in a rule I've ever seen. I mean, that's basically the agency saying, we don't know what to say. So I think DEP ought to figure that out. And if DEP is confused by its jurisdiction over the 280 great ponds in the state's unorganized and deorganized areas designated as outstanding and the 66 great ponds um, as having outstanding or significant scenic quality in Maine's finest lake study. If they don't know whether they have jurisdiction over those, 
How do they know they have jurisdiction to remove, to prohibit the removal of ore in, on, or under great ponds, rivers, brooks, and streams? Those, those two groups overlap. So I, I find this section very confusing and, and somewhat troubling. Um, there's been a lot of talk about whether DEP has jurisdiction over public reserve lands and reference to an attorney general letter that says they don't. Um, Title 12, Section 549, which uh, Dr. Marvini talked about earlier, says nothing in this subchapter may de and that's the, uh, the mining legislation that applies to state-owned lands. It says, uh, sec Title 12, Section 549C says, nothing in this subchapter may be deemed to relieve any ex explorer or mining lessee from the obligation to comply with all applicable environmental and other regulatory laws and rules of the state. To me, that says anybody working on these state-owned lands would need, to would need to comply with DEP's rules. Mining rules would come, under, would come under all applicable environmental and or other regulatory laws and rules of the state. And if DEP's rules apply, wouldn't the citing provisions of DEP's rules apply? So if I'm correct in that interpretation, DEP does have the authority to say a mine can't be cited in Dabuli or Namakanta or Tilas. And if I'm wrong and DEP needs some clarification about that, the administration can ask which, whatever the relevant legislative committee is to please give them that authority. They could put in a bill and do that. They've had many opportunities to do that. They have not done that. Now that may be because they haven't thought of it, or it may be because what they really want to do is open up those lands for mining, I don't know. But it doesn't, um, we heard a little bit before about the social license to mine and confidence in regulations. It doesn't give me confidence. I don't really know what they're saying here. They're saying, we can't do anything other than what we've done. We're, we, we, we can't ask the legislature for changes. All we have is the authority given us in, in um, the 2012 law. They've had four legislative sessions since then where they could have uh, asked for clarity, asked for additional authority, and they have not. We think that has to change. Again, um, as I mentioned before, we don't think that the dangerous components of mines should be allowed in floodplains or flood hazard areas. The requirement that DEP puts in these rules in 20B1, saying that all such structures must, comp must show that they can uh, withstand a 500-year flood is not a meaningful requirement. What does that even mean? How is a pit supposed to withstand a 500-year flood? You can't put walls up around the pit. How, is, how are people going to get into the pit? It doesn't make any sense to allow these types of operations in floodplains. As in prior versions of these rules, and we had a lot of discussion about this last session at the legislature, so these are not new things that NRCM is asking DEP for clarity on. The language having to do with wet mine waste units is extremely confusing. There's this thing called a wet mine waste unit they don't describe what it is. I don't really know whether it's a pond or some kind of enclosure. It's just called a wet mine waste unit. If you Google that, you will find that nowhere. It's a term that DEP made up. Um, and it seems to be something they've developed specifically to deal with the Ball Mountain Mine because if you look at the 1990 consultant report for um, Belidin that I reference in this testimony, they said the following. Acid base accounting tests performed on the mine rocks as part of this study have demonstrated that the 13 million tons of football mine rock and 12 million tons of massive sulfide mine rock would be potentially highly acid generating. And the massive sulfide rock contains up to 50% sulfur and exhibits a very high net acid generation potential. It would be necessary to place this material below water soon after the rock has been mined. And that makes some sense, right? Because Mining companies put acid generating waste rock below water to limit its exposure to oxygen. It's the combination of oxygen and water reacting with the sulfur that gives you acid mine drainage. So by covering 
uh, waste that's high in sulfur with water, you reduce its exposure to oxygen. You don't eliminate it. It's still going to generate acid because there's oxygen in the water too. But it's exposed to less oxygen, so you lower the rate of the acid mine drainage uh, reaction that occurs with the sulfur and oxygen. But then DEP says you can't have a wet mine waste unit except during the active life and life of the line, mine. I think that's a meaningless requirement again. If you have a pond that you've put 12 million tons of acid gen generating mine rock in it, what are you going to do with it afterwards? Those things have to be kept covered permanently with water covers to be effective. That's what mining companies do. They don't take millions of tons of waste rock out of that and ship it somewhere else. That would be a terribly dangerous operation. And so this is a requirement on paper that nobody's going to meet in real life. And what that means is that if we have mines with very acid-generating waste that um, require uh, water covers, we're going to be stuck with dealing with those water covers, those ponds containing the acid-generating waste. Over time, hundreds of years, there will be acid generated in significant quantities, and it will leach out. And that's something that, you know, if we're going to go forward with mines in those types of war bodies, everybody should be aware of that that's going to happen. And that's got to have some public support and legislative support, and people have to be aware that that's what's going to happen. Finally, and I know I've gone on a while here, I hope it's been useful, um, DEP has a totally different definition of tailings pond from a wet mine waste unit. A tailings pond is a type of wet mine waste unit. Tailings come out of uh, beneficiating operations where the ore is crushed and mixed with chemicals in water to separate the valuable metals from the stuff that isn't valuable, and then that slurry of waste rock and uh, processing chemicals and water goes into a pond, and that's called a tailings pond or a tailings impoundment. Often, especially at um, sites with high sulfur ore, those tailings are also acid generation, generating. So mining companies keep those covered with water as well. And those are permanent fixtures on the landscape after you get done with a mine, with all the risks that, are, uh, that go along with that, like a tailings dam failure, which is what we saw happen at Mount Polly. Um, so, again, the idea, I don't, I don't know whether, what the difference between a wet mine waste unit and a, and a tailings pond is. They seem to me like they should be the same thing. Um, we asked DEP to clarify that uh, last, uh, last time this went through with the legislature, and we never got a clarification about it. So it is frustrating to see that, that um, those apparently contradictory definitions again. So I guess, in conclusion, what I would say is that NRCM does oppose these rules. Um, it's clear that DEP has identified areas where it doesn't feel it has authority, and it may or may not be right about that, to address some of the issues that many others, not just me, have thought of as very important for having uh, protective mining regulations. And so maybe what DEP needs to do is figure out what it needs for statute, statutory changes and go forward with those, working with the people who are concerned about this, and then come back with some rules. Because this process seems to me that there's a very good chance it's going to end up in the same place, which is a big fight in the legislature that ends up with the rejection of these rules. And I'd be happy to take any questions. mine waste units. Um, an earlier gentleman said essentially you should begin as you intend to go. You know, if you're going to have uh, wet mine waste units, expect that they're going to have to be there in perpetuity or whatever, or start with dry and stay dry. Uh, now, do you have a view on that? Yes, absolutely. I think that's spot on. So, for example, um, some of the uh, more model mines that you see, uh, there's a good example on um, Forest Service land in Alaska, and I can't remember the name of the mine. I want to say Red Dog, but that might not be right. 
But anyway, mm -hmm. I could find out about it and I can put it in um, my written testimony where they have dry tailings management. And they start out with dry tailings. You take the tailings out of, of the beneficiating process and you put them through a press and squeeze the water out of them essentially. And then you bury those. There's a caveat to this, however. You can't really do this type of dry management um, if the waste is too acid generating because the way to cope with waste that's really acid generating, which is what, you, what you've got at Bald Mountain, is to cover it with water. I don't know how else you could deal with that. And so dry management requires that you have a process of looking very holistically at the ore body right from the get-go and saying, can we do this safely? First of all, safely means dry tailings management because then you get rid of the whole slew of risks that go with tailings dam collapse, which is pretty bad. That's really something we don't want to have happen in Maine. It's really something nobody wants to have happen, so this is a way around that. So you have to look at the ore body and see, does it have the characteristics that um, are required in order to go forward with a dry tailings management program? So that's how you start. Step one is find the right ore, ore bodies. Don't mine in super dangerous ones. So that's the first process of starting from the beginning. Then you dewater the tailings as you go. Right from the get-go, as soon as they're coming out of the beneficiating process, they're put through a press and you dewater them. You can't just put them in a big pond, cover them with water, and then take the water off the top at some other point because then you're going to have rain and air to, that the tailings are exposed to and you're going to get large amounts of acid generation. Does that answer the question? Could I make a comment, please? The, uh, at Eagle Mine, there is a con the material uh, that's taken out from underneath the ground in the ore body uh, goes back into the ore body and gets pushed back in, and in not all cases, but many cases, it's concreted in. And then you've got like a special case of dry, and not only dry, but dry, but stable. Right. And not only just stable, it's structurally stable. Right. So you're not talking about block falling or anything like that. You're basically pushing it back in right. where you took it out. So uh, those are the kinds of things that need to be deliberated upon when, when someone's deciding how are we gonna actually, if we are gonna go in and take that deposit out, how are we gonna get it out? We meaning whomever the mining organization is, what are they going to do? Then there are good examples of being able to do it that way. I was just throw that out again. Yeah, and I, and I, I think again, the, the Eagle Mine has, you know, that permitting process went on for many, many, many years, and there was a lot of scrutiny given to that process. And um, I suspect that part of the reason they were able to go forward is they were able to do that kind of procedure. That's not something you can do in every ore body. The thing that you should know just off the bat about the Eagle Mine is that they have kind of gotten around the perpetual treatment issue by shipping a lot of stuff that does need to be perpetually, treat, perpetually treated off-site to Canada to another facility that allows perpetual treatment. So there's going to be some waste rock that's going off-site that will be perpetually treated. Um, that's not necessarily a great thing. Um, but I agree with you, that particular aspect of the Eagle Mining, of the Eagle Mine operation is, is promising. I don't know whether it would work for any of our ore bodies. Might, might not, but you'd have to look at, you'd have to look at the, the, the given ore bodies. Thank you very much.